Early U.S. crafts, technology, and industry were brought by European immigrants and have evolved from the techniques of all the prehistoric and pre-industrial peoples throughout the world. An animal skin is turned into soft leather by tanning. The procedures used to tan hides have come down to us from our gatherer-hunter ancestors who figured out how to make clothing, bags, homes, and rope and such from animal hides. In fact, this crucial knowledge helped us human beings to spread from the warm equatorial regions of the earth toward its frozen poles. For thousands of years, leather has been our multi-purpose material. Since ancient times, tanning involved soaking animal skins in the sorts of naturally existing chemicals readily available, including tan bark from oak trees, animal dung, salt, lime, water, and alum. The hides of cow, ox, horse, buffalo, and moose were tanned, while the thinner skins of calf, sheep, pig, deer, and goats were tawed. Tanning hides were kept in pits for one year, and then dried and beaten to make them softer. Tanning pits have a terrible smell. We saw that ancient Mesopotamian cities were divided into zones to keep such industrial districts away from the residential areas. Most every New England village was within smelling range of a tannery and dreaded the days that the wind blew from it. Tan leather was used for sedans and carriage tops and their curtains and for shoes, boots, breeches, book covers, gloves, drum heads, saddles, animal harnesses, and the protective aprons of the metalsmith, along with their bellows. A farming family could choose to try themselves to tan the hide of its deceased cow, or instead take the hide to an expert tanner who would do a better job. The tanner returned the tan hide to the family, but kept half in payment for the service. The tanner also kept the hair, which was sold to plasters to hold their lime mortar together, and sold the inedible debris or offal, which was sold to peddlers who sold it to glue makers. Only in the last few decades has our understanding of chemistry resulted in any significant change in the tanning process. The family might next take their tan hide to a shoemaker who would use that specific piece of hide to make shoes for that customer. Eventually, the shoemaker began selling previously made shoes for less money than was charged for making shoes from hide brought by a customer. The shoemaker was called a cord wainer until about the year 1700. These unrecognizable words show that such occupations are older than our modern language. The shoemaker made holes to attach buckles, but did not attach any. Instead, the purchaser would attach their own buckles. Shoe and boot soles were made from thick hide that occurs near an animal's backbone. Thinner belly hide is used for shoe uppers. The entire cloth making process is ancient. The Guise explained that silk was made into cloth in China as early as 3000 BC. Japan and India first learned the Chinese secret and then Alexander the Great took it back to Greece from India. Arabs first took cotton cloth to Spain in the 10th century AD. Several thousand years ago, Ancient Mesopotamians were herding sheep and making cloth and clothing from the fleece of sheep. Yarn was spun by hand by twisting fibers between one's fingers and thumb into an increasingly longer thread. This was done by hand until the invention of the spinning wheel. The first illustration of a spinning wheel is from Baghdad in the year 1237 AD. Hodges shows pictures of Mesopotamian and Egyptian looms from before 3000 BC. Looms were incrementally improved every century or so. 
and these improvements would slowly bounce back and forth between lands as distant as China and Europe with transmission through India and the Islamic equator. We saw that the first factories of our industrial revolution developed as cloth merchants acquired the looms of the weavers and brought them into a central shop. Looms have been used in every city on every continent. Today's mechanized looms are not too different from ancient designs. Cloth woven on the loom is next dyed to a fashionable color and then taken to a fuller who cleans the cloth, compacts the fibers, and uses long scissors to cut away any unevenly raised nap. The cloth was then taken to the tailor to be made into clothing. Patterns were being printed on cotton cloth in India before the year 1600 AD. Adventurers took some back to England where other types of cloth began to be printed. The cloth was covered with an unconnected repetition of a single picture, which was applied with a die-covered woodcut block. This block had been gouged away everywhere except where the lines of the pattern existed. These ridges imprinted the pattern of dye onto the material. Typically flowered patterns were printed. This technique was used to print cloth and also wallpaper. In France, in the early 1700s, Jean Papillon made the first repeating block pattern and this led to the use of continuous rolls of wallpaper, which first arrived in the colonies from England around 1730. After 1750, it was also bought from China. The oldest known colonial made wallpaper was printed in 1794 by William Pointel who advertised that it was cheaper than whitewashing and hid dirt and fly specks. Tunis tells how Ben Franklin convinced the cloth printer John Hewson to emigrate from England to the U.S. Hewson illegally took his cloth printing knowledge out of England, which was trying to protect its monopoly on these techniques. England put a high price on Hewson's head when he fought in the Revolution. George and Martha Washington wore some of his gown patterns. While cloth is woven, felt is made by beating, crushing, and boiling fibers into a matted form following simple but ancient procedures. In the upper right, we see material rolled up so that it could be crushed. Felt hats were popular. Britain tried to limit hat making in its colonies by restricting the number of apprentices that each hat maker could train. Still, in the year 1732, Boston and New York each produced 10,000 hats. Felt hats were made from sheep or llama wool or from beaver, otter, seal, muskrat, or rabbit. Since the fashionably curled edges of a felt hat will unravel in a hard rain, many hat makers were kept busy reblocking hats. A person who could not afford this service instead wore flat brims. The video shows the felting process being used to make a yurt home. Today, felt is made in much the same way on an industrial scale. How has the yarn and cloth making process changed in recent centuries? Well, today I'm spinning some turquoise roving, and the whole trick to uh, spinning is pinch, pull, and twist. Right now I'm pinching and pulling the roving and then letting the machine or the wheel do the twist part. And you can see it kind of puffs up and I pull it through and it twists the roving and then it feeds onto the spool. Notice that tugging with greater force would make a smaller diameter in the finished string. This process requires some dexterity. It's hard to imagine that a mechanical wooden device can be built to perform this whole task. But in England in 1764, James Hargreave made his spinning jenny 
which sp simultaneously spun cotton on eight spindles. The rollers do the pinching and pulling that she just described. The vertical pair on the left rotates at a faster rate then does the middle pair and this pulls and stretches the yarn. The pair on the right rotate at the lowest speed. The wheel on the lower right serves to twist the yarn. Thomas Hayes thought of stretching yarn with rollers and Richard Arkwright copied them in his first water powered loom. The new weavers prospered but hand spinners did not. Today's machinery spins 1,000 at a time. Yarn is next woven into cloth using a loom, which was also done by hand until Edmund Cartwright patented a power loom in 1785. In 1801, Joseph Marie Jacquard invented a loom that can be programmed to make any desired design. Tunis describes the clever manner in which the movement of loom parts was planned to produce a final pattern. These cards would or would not lift a bar and raise the yarn wherever the cards did or did not have a hole punched. Today's looms do the same mechanical motions as has been done on hand looms for 5,000 years. Today's looms just move more quickly. For us human beings, the Industrial Revolution began in England and consisted of the factory that brought many workers together into a single building full of machinery. To maintain its advantages, England tried to outlaw the exportation of its new factory machinery, its designs, and even its operators, who were called mechanics because they worked with mechanical gears. Customs agents made inspections to monitor who and what was living in England because other nations were anxious to obtain information about these new techniques. Only 150 English machinery builders are known to have managed to immigrate to the U.S. with their knowledge of English mills. Though these persons typically had little experience, they helped build the first factory machinery in the U.S. This machinery differed in the heavily forested New England, where wheels and gears were more often wooden than metal, as used in Europe. Also, the labor pool was much smaller in New England, so its mechanics designed machines that required fewer attending workers.